on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hiker and Layman, presented by River Wind Casino. We recap OU's win over Iowa State and some of the other great games in week nine of college football. And we finish up giving you our winners and losers of the weekend. Please download and subscribe to the podcast, rate it five stars, and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right, our man Michael Hostie will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Monday, October 31st, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful award-winning environment plays host more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match, Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts. And to learn more about their gaming promotions and entertainment options in the month of November, can you believe it's November almost? Oh my gosh. Visit Riverwind.com, Riverwind Casino, Simply the best. Now recording this Sunday night. Please leave us a five-star review and a nice comment. Happy Halloween, Ted. Let's go. Let's go, man. Two straight? What? Two straight wins. Are we streaking? Are we streaking? Awesome. Yeah, good weekend. Uh, It was uh, was perfect football weather up there in Ames. Got a W. I can't complain, man. I... I had, we were concerned about what the trip home would be like if, if they weren't able to get the job done, but we didn't have to worry about it. We didn't have to worry about it. I will say this. No one takes longer to leave a road venue than the Oklahoma Sooners. Oh my gosh. We gotta, we gotta ramp up the efficiency, the efficiency of that operation. Where's the, there's gotta be someone designated as the hurry up guy. I, just rounding everyone together and getting them out of the it it's wild. one guy man we don't have to sugarcoat it. it's the head ball coach <laughs> he likes to bask in the uh the victory and i love that about him but trying to get home man i mean we could we could speed it up right Let's bask I mean, that's on fair. the buses and on the plane right yeah that's good i'm just i we're just being selfish you know we're just like ah uh, trying to get home what are, what are we doing here but we made it home safely it was great. They got a win. Normally, we start with offense or defense. But with this game, you got to start with special teams, right? Yeah. I, I, think, I think when so. when you look at Zach Schmidt and Michael Turk's impact on this game, right, it was, it was huge. And we talked about that coming into the game, that it was strength on strength, weakness on weakness. So there could be a lot of money made for Oklahoma in the third phase of the game, especially with some of Iowa State's special team struggles. And that's exactly what happened, right? Uh, Zach Schmidt hit his kicks. Also, clearly, the fake field goal for the touchdown. Beautiful flip. That's great preparation, great scouting, and great execution by everyone involved. And it worked perfectly, just how they, they had it drawn up. And then, man, Turk... He had a massive impact on the game, punting the football. I mean, he absolutely did. So both of those guys yard average. Yeah. Casual 49 and a half. And remember a couple of those were one steppers out of his own end zone. Backed up. No return, which he just hammered some moon shots, which I'm not sure people realize how significant those punts in particular were, but the special teams phase was a difference in the game. Right. I mean, Sooners were great in special teams. No doubt. Um, they were excellent. Uh, the, the specialist, uh, you know, Schmidt was great and Turk was great. You know, it's easy to look at the, the points scored with the field goals and obviously the fake, but the lost yardage, the hidden yardage in the punt stuff was, you know, was incredible. I uh, yeah, we we got put in a in a bad spot against a really good defense. Whenever you are in the shadow of your own goalpost coming out, it's hard to get anything going and and we couldn't. So we're having to punt. Like he didn't even have a full run at it. 
uh, you know, he's inside the 14 and a half yards that the, that you usually have, which means you just got to catch it and let it rip. And to hit, you know, 55, 60 yard punts in the air off the off the foot with no return out of that situation, because, you know, you are not only are you are you short stepping it as a punter, but as a protection group, you're not getting out to cover as quickly because you're so worried about the the block and them coming up the middle because of because of the the short snap distance and all those things so having a punt like that is is critical and he was he was nails man it was awesome yeah i think really when you look at special teams as a whole what maybe mims not catching that one that rolled all the way down there yeah. and, and pinned OU deep that's that's really the only thing you can point to and go okay yeah that was that that was not a good special teams play other than that I mean, it was a huge weapon for Oklahoma in this game, and it needed to be. And hey, kicker scoring touchdowns. I'm all for it, man. Hey. I'm all for it, especially when they are the pride of Bishop McGinnis Catholic <laughs> High School. I am all for it, Ted. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I, it caught me by surprise for sure. The moment in the game, no real desperation. Uh, you know, I, you can look at maybe your season as a whole and and think that you you've got to get creative and have some things happen and look for a spark but yeah that was uh I thought that was a fantastic call it caught everyone by surprise yeah no doubt and uh, I talked to Zach Schmidt about about it after the game no celebration I was like I was like what what was that where was the celebration he said there was a plan and he just kind of blacked out forgot <laughs> which is so great it's such a great answer I I totally understand it. I totally get that. That's hilarious. Oh, that's great. All right, let's talk some of your defense, right? And you look at it, wasn't perfect, but much improved, right? Yeah. I thought all things considered, outside of a couple of fourth and tens, oh, that was so frustrating. Um, I thought I thought it was it was it was pretty good. It's pretty good. It was not great, right? But, you know, we're grading on a curve here, and I think I continue to see improvement. Generally speaking, thought the defensive line did a really good job against the run. Thought they did a really good job uh, applying a lot of pressure to Deckers. Sack numbers are not huge, but he had pressure in his face pretty much the entire time. Affected a lot of his throws. Um I thought the backers, Stutzman in particular, looked really good. Thought he was improving. Um, he continues to improve. Had the interception to steal it, which was awesome. Loved seeing that for him. Um, really good there. And on the back end, a rotation of guys coming in and getting playing time. I don't know that we've – like it, it's still – unfortunately kind of in a in a position where we're still trying some different guys out back there but um all in all I thought coverage was was pretty good we had the one bust on uh, a blitz with the motion left a tight end uncovered on the short side of the field um but generally speaking I thought we played really well like uh, what what I expected that they would do to a struggling Iowa State deep, uh, offense, they did. Yeah, and, and that was that was what we talked about coming in the game, and, and most more specifically, could they stop the run? And Iowa State couldn't run the ball at all, right? right. If you take away that long Decker scramble for, I think that was like twenty eight yards. Oh, that's the one that play makes me so mad. The look that you just had um, on your face. You all right, man. That, that play, man, I'm telling you that play is like there in, in college football and in pro football, there people are going to make throws on you. Guys are going to make plays. Guys are going to make great catches, but to have two inside backers have Hunter Decker's vice, like he's right in between you, and to let him and to cross over and let him get outside of you and escape, that is inexcusable. That is that is the one play. That play is worse 
than the the missed assignment where we left the guy free running down the field, in my opinion. That's how bad that was. That's, that's the that play is the that's the sour play of the football game for me. And I, I'm sure it has nothing to do with it being the inside backers. It's not like you pay any extra attention to those guys. Yeah, well, it's it's just it's so easy. It's it just maintain leverage. Uh, it's not easy. I shouldn't say that. The, making the play is not easy, but the concept of maintaining leverage is easy. It is your best friend at all times, and it is the absolute fundamental principle of playing defense at a at a high level. That was the frustration. That was the biggest frustrating play. Other than that, you, uh, I mean, three turnovers, right? Yeah. You you forced the three interceptions. You know, we we talked about it going into the game. Hunter Deckers, he'll throw it to the other team. And he absolutely did. Now, the Woody Washington one, that's just a really nice play on the ball from Woody. Now, it wasn't a tremendous throw or anything like that, yeah. but the Stutzman interception, I thought that that was, it wasn't a great throw. I'm not going to pretend like it was. I thought that showed a little progress from Stutzman when it comes to understanding his responsibilities underneath in the zone coverage stuff, the kind of some more pattern recognition. Yeah. Is that, uh, is that accurate to say? Absolutely. He, on that play, he, um, he gets, he's getting to his drop 45 degree angle to his right turns, finds the receiver behind him, settles, fills the quarterback and turns his hips and goes back the other direction and ends up making the interception. I thought it was great. I, and, you know, I, I've, I continue to pound the drum on this. He's a true sophomore. He's on schedule for where he needs to be to be a great player. And as we enter the back half of the season, all those little things that you're seeing that he's doing just a little bit better, positioning's a little bit better, recognition, a little bit better, technique, playing low, all of those things are just getting a little bit better week by week. And, you know, here down the it, – it, it'll start to accelerate here. And I think that he's going to close the season with probably his best games in a row. I think Kansas was his best game. Now Iowa State, I think he'll continue that. Now looking at other guys that you thought, you know, really played well, clearly Deshaun White, the tackle numbers yeah. stand out among everyone. Thought Deshaun White was really good. He was uh, he was a force in the pressure packages as well. Um, continues to be a little late on some of those, which is a huge pet peeve of mine. Some coaches coach it different. They'd rather disguise longer. Uh, I believe that you get right in it. Doesn't matter if they see it or not. We're talking about numbers, and guys are going to have to win one on ones. You just you can't bank on coming absolutely free at this level of football anymore. It just doesn't happen. People are too good at setting protections. Uh, so I say just get in and go win one-on-ones. But I don't know what, what he's being taught. Uh, he was great. He was great. He's, he continues to look way faster than what he is, and that is a compliment. That's what good football players look like. They look faster than what the numbers say they are, and um, he's, he's continued to grow into that role and, and flourish. I thought on the defensive line, I thought Luulu, Isaiah Co, and Ethan Downs all had some really good moments. Jonah Luulu had some really good good uh, snaps out there, playing some of the zone read stuff, holding point, fighting to be an anchor on on some of the perimeter runs that they had, fighting to get outside and contain. Thought he did really good. I thought I thought he used his length the best yeah. we've seen him. Right. Like he finally, it's like he figured out he's got really, really long arms. He was like, you know what? I should use these. And uh, that was, long that was by and far. Square get you a long way at yeah. that position. If you can stay square and you can use your length, you're right. So I, I thought that was good. <laughs> you mentioned Isaiah Coe. He had some nice splash plays before his thumb shot out the side of his, his bone shot out the side of his thumb. Is that what happened? Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering. I saw him after the game with the. Did you see his tweet? <laughs> uh uh. It was like, what? Y'all ever had a bone go, you know, poke through your skin? I thought it was cool. I was like, oh my <laughs> gosh, psycho. 
uh, at some point, uh, you know, whenever we're on something else, I have a story about that with a linebacker I played with at OU, Wayne Chambers. That's a story for another day, but it's a funny one. Well, he probably doesn't think it's funny. I I thought it was funny, but um, I thought he played well, man. Whenever he, we've talked about this all year. When he's low, he is a force in the middle. Whenever he's low and he's blowing through a gap, you almost cannot stop the guy. Um, so that's kind of it on the back end. I thought, I thought for the most part, we tackled well on the perimeter, on the bubble stuff. There was a couple of times where it got out on us. Um, I thought safeties, if you look at our safeties now, and it's not all good, but if you look at them now compared to two, three games ago, the attack coming downhill and some of the run play stuff is night and day difference. Like seeing it, seeing the exchange and triggering and going and hitting your gap and hitting your support uh, position for that uh, particular run scheme is is great. Now, we're not making all of those tackles, but the, at least – you're decisive and you define it for the rest of your teammates. And I thought that was pretty good too. Yeah. All right. You got anything else defensively? Turnovers, man. Turnovers are huge. That's the difference. And, you know, not particularly in this game, but in other games, a lot of times you can play poorly, but if you take advantage of some situations, make interceptions, make some plays whenever you have the opportunity, you can mask a lot of deficiencies. So when you combine turnovers with all around solid play, you, uh, you come up with the day like we had Saturday. Yeah. And I, I did think all things considered good job limiting Xavier Hutchinson, who I think is a really, really good football player. Yep. I think a, a lot of that had to do, there was some really good tight coverage on him. Yeah. Um, so credit those guys, but, there was also really good pressure around Deckers. Again, it doesn't show up necessarily in the stat sheet. I wouldn't even say necessarily a lot of those were hurries, but he rarely had a good platform to throw from, and we had hands up around his face the entire time. Good stuff. Yeah. All right, let's talk some OU offense against the Cyclones. We knew coming into this one, this was strength on strength, and the offense didn't necessarily score a lot. Right. Uh, I understand that they left yards. And as a result of leaving those yards out there, left points out there on the field. Uh, let's start with Dylan Gabriel. I, I know they didn't rack up, you know, 40 plus points. I get it. I thought he played a really nice game. Yeah. I, I thought there were some moments. There were some moments in this game where I thought he was playing quarterback at the highest level he's played it at all season you know for example the Farouk TD and I know Farouk gets lost back there they they bust he, he's wide open but just watching him stay calm trusting the pocket you know stepping up because both Wanya Morris on uh, on that play Wanya Morris and Anton Harrison they run their guys around and there's actually a pretty funny collision behind the quarterback on that play. Go watch it, people. It's a, it, it's great. But Dylan doesn't panic. He steps up. There's good depth in the pocket. Keeps his eyes down the field. Delivers an accurate football for a touchdown. And, you know, there's been times this year where that exact scenario plays out and he kind of freaks out a little bit. Pulls it, runs, which yep. isn't always a bad decision. Or, uh, you know, tries to... Like the the natural tendency, and I feel like it's more of a natural tendency for guys that aren't, you know, six three back there. The natural tendency is chaos. Try to get outside, right? Yeah. And a lot of times when you try to get outside to clear that that vision windows whenever you run into sacks. Yeah, and you you think about it, same play, right? Marcus Major is stepping up and Ooh. stoning the guy in the a gap, which. Yeah. He deserves credit for that, but also DG, he just trusted it. You know, hey, trusted the guys to protect him. And I think that that was, that was more a result of what he's seen from this O-line lately and kind of how they were playing in this game. Totally agree. Which, yep. which I think is a very positive sign. So I, I thought 
all in all, I mean, the truth is if Marvin Mims catches the ball, DG stats look a whole lot different, right? I mean, that's, yep. that's just the truth. So you, you look at only 148 yards passing and one touchdown. I mean, he's probably well over 250 yards, probably a couple touchdowns and it, it just didn't end up working out that way. But even though the stats look the way that they do, other than him really needing to work on that sliding technique, my goodness, <laughs> I I thought that I thought he was pretty good, all things considered, man. I I know it wasn't four hundred yards passing, but yeah, it was pretty efficient and clean. Well, best defense in the Big Twelve. Um yeah. so that's really what you needed. And going into the game. My biggest concern was the maybe trying to do more than you need to, trying to get too aggressive. And I thought, especially considering the way the defense was playing, that he did a really good job. Like you said, the stats don't blow you away, but he was clean. He was efficient. He was smart with the football. He took what they gave him. He did not force anything, and that left you with a, a, a clean game where you were able to um, – able to. it was really a, for the most part, a stress-free day because you didn't put yourself in any of those really bad situations. You had the turnover early from Eric Gray, but you know outside of that fumble, which, which ended up happening in there into the field, which was pretty good, outside of that, smart, clean, efficient football game. You don't want to mess around too much with Iowa State. Whenever you've got a lead, your defense is playing well, just lean on it. And lean on those special teams. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but uh, running back-wise, running the ball for 182 yards on that defense should not go unnoticed. That's that's a heck of an effort, man. And Nearly doubling up their average, what they give up. Yeah, I I thought I thought Jeff Levy did a really nice job with his creativity and versatility in the run game. They threw I mean, I chart every play when I go back and watch it. They threw a lot out of them. Yeah. <laughs> I mean a lot. You're talking about gap scheme, different variations of the GT with different variations of motion in the backfield, split zone, you know, 12 different ways. Understood. They brought out that the handback, uh, they ran that handback. They ran it with some split zone action. They ran one back tackle power. They ran G lead, which we hadn't seen before. Uh, I mean, and then they built play action and RPO stuff off of all of that. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't perfect, but man, there was some creative stuff. Yeah. And you had, you had your, your quicks and stuff that have to factor into the run game as well, even though their perimeter, uh, type things quarterback run game built in there as well Let's little see, option we, yeah uh speed option we direct snapped right do we direct snap one yeah direct uh, snap to farouk as well yep. yep there's a lot of stuff in there which is great i mean that's what you want you want you want variety um and you know as that as you continue to build that base it gets more and more difficult to defend as a as a future opponent what are we getting this week? What do you think? What are we going to see? And, you know, it gets harder and harder to really zero in on a couple of things. you got to remember, when we started off this season, we were almost exclusively a split zone and counter team. And that has expanded quite a bit here in the recent weeks. No doubt. All right, Eric Gray, I, I know he had the fumble, but other than that, I thought, I thought he played hard. And he had... He had that stretch where he was in the injury tent for forever. And it, what's it, going on there? I don't know. He said he he was stre he was trying trying to stretch something out. I it's obviously his right leg. I don't know, but there there must have been a thorough stretching. That is I, so strange. That's what he told I, us after the game. I'll just tell you. Twice I've seen him come off the field not being able to put any pressure on his leg at all the first time i was like oh my god he's done done for the season this is bad and he was back before any time at all this time 
I saw him come off and I was like, oh, he'll be back in a minute. It was the same thing that happened, um, you know, against Kansas. It took a lot longer and I was like, oh boy, well, he got me though. I've never seen anyone be able to, to go off the field, not being able to apply any pressure and limping or hobbling that bad, come back in a football game. Yeah, well, he did it again. I almost like the rope-a-dope on the defense. Maybe <laughs> he should start doing it all the time. It's like, finally, he's gone, and here he comes, fourth quarter, jogging out there like nothing's wrong. Yeah, but I, I thought he, he ran with really good physicality, and you have to against Iowa State. There was a lot of spinning and twisting at the end of runs, and he took a couple of big shots mm -hmm. as a result of that, but gained a lot of extra yards with that extra effort, which added up over the course of the game. Uh, good vision, good patience. Uh, and, and remember, when you play Iowa State, the holes are not – they're not gaping, right? So I thought that he he did a really nice job of finding those cracks because they're cracks against Iowa State. They're not creases. They're cracks. Right. And he did, he did a really nice job running tough through them. And a lot of those – you know, where we've seen him get on the perimeter and it's him versus the free player and he's left that guy hugging air. Typically, it's him versus the free player in a massive amount of space, which gives him a lot of leeway on, on how to make that guy miss, right? Big open area. Against Iowa State, he was still successful even though that space was condensed. Instead of being the size of a, you know, you could drive a truck through it, you could drive maybe a, a moped through it and he was still making that guy miss is really impressive he's he's become excellent at that and there's like there's a timing to it that I feel like he he figured out you know after a couple of games this season just to it's the whole and I kind of I'm waiting on some of the defensive linemen to find this out like Luulu on the edge and downs it's almost like it's the smoothest fast right if you just kind of re almost relax and just let it come to you, you end up moving faster and being harder to tackle. And it feels like Eric Gray has, has found that perfect little, I don't know what it is. The timing there is just excellent. Yeah. And it's going to continue to need to be because all of a sudden you look up and this team's thin at running back, right? No Jamonte doubt. Barnes yeah. didn't even make the trip. Sounds like it's a hammy, but Marcus major he has not looked the same since he got injured. Yeah. I mean, this was a guy where every time you touched the ball, you were just like, man, that dude can go. I do not have the same reaction, right? It seems like the horsepower, maybe that's the best word for it. Like the horsepower that he had early in the season when he was healthy, it, it's just not there right now. Now he, it's not, he didn't play bad or anything like that. He just does not have the same pop he had. He came off fairly early after a run and was was limping off over there, pointing out his leg, and he came back in the game, but he needed a, a couple of snaps there. So I think it I I think you're on to something there where even though he's back and he's playing, he's still not like he was early in the season, still not hundred percent. Yeah. All right, let's talk about the wide receivers. Gotta start with Mims. Just not a great day at the office. Um, I, I will say I have been, I, I've been down on the sideline for every game that Marvin Mims has played at OU. Now, I think the year he was a freshman was the year I started doing the radio broadcast with you guys. I've never seen him look that angry. I mean, the look of anger on his face, and it was after, you know, we dropped the big third down there late in the game. He, I mean, he was just furious at himself and I, I hadn't seen that before and if if he just catches the ball like he usually does he has a huge statistical day against Iowa State and, and that's that's probably really frustrating for him it's frustrating for for the entire offense right that first play of the game I mean it's a beautiful design by Levy I mean he's wide up I don't know if he goes scores a touchdown but it's a 50 yard gain at the very least. And to take your eyes off that one and drop it and kind of set the tone for your day with that first yeah. play. Seems like it kind of snowballed on him a little bit. Well, it set was his first play of the game against TCU. The fumble was that his first touch of the day on that one. 
Yeah, might be, might have been. And that kind of set the tone on that day as well. Um, yeah, he's better than that, and I don't expect him to to go into a slump here. But I don't know. You can see him visibly frustrated out there. He was pissed off. Like, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I for whatever reason, I, I just my my worry is that the frustration doesn't end up being pointed in the wrong place. You know, um, like some of those deep, like the one deep ball. Uh, I'll say it. I, I got no problem saying it. I expect Marvin Mims to catch that ball. Yeah. With, with, with the type of player I think he is. I mean, it's on his hands. It, it's one of the best deep balls DG's thrown all season long. I, if, if you are wide receiver one, at the University of Oklahoma, you have to catch that ball. That's just, I mean, it is what it is. So, I mean, you had the big drop on the first play of the game. The one that you're talking about, I thought Dylan Gabriel dropped it in the bucket perfectly. I thought it should have been touchdown. I wrote that down in my notes, drop touchdown. So, I, so I, I expect him to make those plays, and he expects himself to make those plays. And I think that's why we saw the – the level of frustration that we saw from him, almost like what the hell's happening type deal for him. And it's just, I mean, it's just a very uncharacteristic performance from him. Yep. Yeah, it was. Um, I hope it doesn't snowball on him. I hope he gets right back to, to being himself. And I expect that he will. I never saw a replay of, of the penalty. Was it a hold on the first play that was going to be a touchdown? Oh, uh, yeah, it Legit. was a okay. full on and it's it's the same. It's the same stuff I've been telling. And I've told Wanya Morris this to his face, like, stop doing that shit. Is it where he's like grabbing and turning over? Working, it's just completely unnecessary, has full control and didn't need to do it. I'd forgotten about that. Thank you. Now, now my blood pressure's up. Awesome. <laughs> now I feel like Mims. <laughs> angry no but yeah then you know marvin doesn't make that catch and it wouldn't have mattered anyways because there was a dumb hold that didn't need to happen yeah and he tackled him i mean you can't do that that's not playing physical that's playing stupid yeah don't play stupid so other wide receiver stuff uh jaleel farouk uh, really nice catch early Guy's got some back flexibility, Ted. Whoa. Or he does now. Yeah, I don't know if he did before, <laughs> yeah. but he, he's he's limber now. Yeah, that bent him uh bent him backwards. That did not look like it felt good, but that was a really nice play. Yeah, but it was good seeing him get in the end zone. Uh I, I really like the stuff that they could keep doing where they're utilizing him as a ball carrier. That dude can run. Yeah, he finds yards, man. Sometimes it looks like it's been shut down and he still finds ways to make positive yardage out of nothing. Pretty impressive. Yeah, he's he's got good speed on those plays. Uh, I've been impressed. Drake Stoops, uh, that guy ran approximately 37 miles with how much motion they made him do. But he, he did what he always does. He, he blocked hard. He played hard. And he caught the ball on third down and moved the chains. Right, And even they... They did some stuff, and I wonder how thrilled about it he is, but they did some stuff. They put him in the backfield. He's the split zone guy going backside yep. to block the defensive end. And I was like, oh, oh, God. And he did a really good job going uh, going back there on that end man on the line of scrimmage and really getting physical. Uh, I, I'm not sure how much he loves it, but it's just he Drake Stoops had a very Drake Stoops game. Yeah, well, it's good, and I like that you put that in. You know, when you have a when you have a bigger body, a blocking body that's motioning uh, in the backfield, the antenna's up, right? Split action, lead action, counter. He's now uh, part of your your um, keys as a linebacker to take you where the play's going. But usually, when it's a receiver, you're seeing through that. You're not counting him as creating an extra gap in the running game. So that throws an extra wrinkle in there. I like it. I, I will say, I think it surprised everyone involved <laughs> that they ran that split act, split zone action with Drake Stoops down on the goal line. 
was not a huge fan of that call. Can't can't pretend like I was. I was like, wait, what? Uh, uh. And it it did not go well. But okay, tight end wise, Braden Willis did did not have a big day catching the ball. I, I thought he was going to have some more opportunities in the middle of the field. I just didn't happen that way. But in true Braden Willis fashion, didn't matter that he wasn't getting the football guy blocked his ass off just like he always does. And I thought Daniel Parker did some nice things as well in, in the run game and pass protection is really physical. It was, it was exactly the type of game I expect from him with, with his role on this team. So, you know, tied in all around, not a big impact in the passing game, but thought, thought they did some really good stuff, especially when they got in, those sets where, you know, Daniel Parker was the inline tight end and Braden Willis was the wing, man. They caved some dudes down in some yeah. of those concepts. It was good. Yeah. I like that personnel packing uh, package always have, um, you know, Daniel Parker has been for me somewhat hitting hit and miss this season on some stuff. Uh, you know, there's some effort things that I've seen out there and, but it feels like he's the last couple of games have been stronger for him and a little bit more consistent, which I love. Yeah. All right. Offensive line, Anton Harrison, uh, another solid performance from him. Man, I, I won't lie. I, I did a lot of rewinding when him and Will McDonald were going against each other. That was, that was fun. Hey, and I'll give McDonald some credit, man. He, he got him a couple times with the spin and just a quick aside. McDonald is going to go to the senior bowl and he is going to make so much money because I, and I, I know the system that John Haycock is running. It's proven, right? I can't say, Oh, well the system's bad. No, no, no. That system holds him back. Yeah. He, he, if he was playing like a true edge, almost even like a stand up outside linebacker, he'd be, He'd probably already be in the NFL, honestly, but he he will he will get into a system that allows him to do that. His length is stupid. I know it's it is impressive. stupid, and like seeing it down on the field, I was like, oh my god, it, the he's, fat, he's way faster than you would think for someone that's got such long levers. Dude, there's a couple clips in this game where he's on the backside, the ball's completely, uh, I mean, the, the other way, they throw quick, and he is just hauling ass. I'm like, oh, my gosh. He is, he's just not in a system that plays to his skill set. Yeah. So, but that was back to the O-line for Oklahoma. I, I thought Anton was, uh, other than a couple times where Will McDonald got him with the spin move, which he had guard help, so it wasn't even that big of a deal. Yeah, it if you was, lose, him, lose him inside on a counter, right? Yeah. I mean, it is what it is. Now, would you like to, you know, handle a little better? Sure. But Anton continues to be one of the best pass-protecting tackles in all of college football. And the, the thing that I really liked from him, he's starting to see things quicker now, which is good. Uh, I mean, seeing his guy drop and telling the – telling the guard to go and help ba work back inside to kind of clean up the pocket. He, he's doing some stuff that we weren't seeing from him early in the year. As far as the run game, still, still good. I, I would like for him to get a little more physical on the down lineman, uh, some of the double, double team concepts before he climbs to that second level. But, you know, it is what it is. I, I think he can give more in some of those situations, but overall, I mean, he's, he's playing good football. It feels like he, he plays more physical whenever he's hurt and pissed off. <laughs> right. Yes. Whenever he's hobbled, like he's like, like uh, something's wrong with his hip or his knee yeah. or like, is uh, just something. He's just like, I, I, I hate this. Somebody. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I think it's, I think it's awesome. And it's kind of, it's kind of crept up on us, hadn't it, with how good that, you know, he's he's just gotten better week in, week out. Consistency's there. And you look up, and here we are eight games in, and you're like, 
dang, uh, I don't think he's given up a sack. I don't know if he has or not, but it's like you start looking at it's like this dude is we're going on a lot of snaps that he's put together that look really, really, really good with we are, very few bad snaps. We are entering a, a zone where Oklahoma is going to have to replace both tackles. Yeah. And now, because I think, and I have not talked to Wanya Morris about it, he feels like a guy to me that's kind of kind of come out no matter what. That yeah. he feels like one of those guys. Yeah. Now, maybe he ends up coming back, but that I don't. That's just kind of my. That's just my hunch on it. Ready for the next thing, right? I I think he's ready to be out of college. Right, is yeah. kind of the the sense I get. And you know, you think about the things that he's you know, missed some games for in the past, right? It just kind of that type of stuff kind of points to a guy going sooner rather than later. Yeah. Right. But and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, no. and I've said this a lot. There, there are, there are a lot of guys that make better NFL players than they do college players. Cause, cause there's, I guess it's less structured in, to some but degree. And you don't have to deal with all the bullshit. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, you don't have to deal with class and tutors. Like, you show up, you play football. That's it. Yep. That's it. And for some guys, that changes everything. And we, we can just talk about one year. I, I, was not, I was not thrilled with the way he played overall. I, I just want to see – I want to see more consistency from him. I, I still think there's some times out there there's a little too much confusion with how much football he's played. Now, uh, technique-wise, a lot of clamping now instead of striking. And if you're going to clamp, you better be as strong as Andrew Whitworth was. We called that man the lobster. He could clamp because no one could bowl that dude. Like, he was just strong. Wanye doesn't have that type of strength, but this is and, – and this is the frustrating part about Wanye Morris for me. And I talked to Jim Nagy about this earlier in the week, uh, the executive director of the Senior Bowl. His flashes, and what I mean by that, like if you take Wanya Morris's highlights from each game, they're as good as any right tackle in the country. As good as any right tackle in the country, where he's moving guys, he's showing athleticism, he's using his length. You're just like, oh my gosh, that's what it looks like. The problem for me is. He doesn't show that enough. He doesn't show it on a consistent enough basis. I mean, and it was the same thing against Iowa State. He had some moments where you're like, whoa, yeah. And then you had some moments where he's just like, what? It, what? I mean, what's he thinking? What's he doing? And that's that's frustrating for me. I, I want the consistency, but I, I think Juan A. Morris is going to be one of those guys that an NFL team, they grade the flashes. That's a That's a term in the scouting community. Mm-hmm. You grade the flashes. Right, you look at what the potential looks like for an offensive lineman, and if you grade the flashes for him, whew, you got yeah. some good ones, man. But yeah, yeah I just want him to be more consistent. That was that's always been a frustrating thing for me. At like as a player, there's there's some guys that make the easy stuff look amazing, but they make the hard stuff look impossible. Right. I want guys that make the hard stuff look easy. Like whenever you've got like the hardest cut off or you've got some of these things that are just, you know, you're asked to do something on a specific play against a specific player that is, uh, that's, that's going to be a tough ask, but whenever you can win those, that's what, that's what I love. I, I love guys that, that do the gritty stuff and make it and really love those type of, uh, challenges so and not to say that he does it like and those may be the moments that he does look really good and it's some of the easier stuff where maybe he comes off the gas not really speaking to his specific uh instance though but man if you could ever if you could ever just convince someone to flip the switch on all of it right that's yeah that's the hard thing yeah okay left guard uh mccade matoyer and poncho basically split reps there and you get pretty similar results from the two guys I've 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 talked a lot about both of them at this point I thought they both were solid they're not going to blow you away they're just 
No, they're, so, they're both solid players, serviceable players. Is probably now, the best way to describe them. I feel like, and I agree that, like you don't really notice much of a difference with either either guy. But Conjol definitely moves better. Yeah, I feel like since they've started rotating that for whatever reason, it seems it, it seems like they're better together than just having the one guy play there, whether yeah, it's, it's conditioning or what. Yeah. Whatever. It's like the both guys are fresher. Yeah. Right? You're like, Hey, you guys are pretty similar. I'm going to play. I'm going to give you a couple of series and then you're going to switch and you're going to get to play fresh. It's not, I mean, it's not the worst thing in the world. It's really yeah. not, but Andrew Rame. One thing that I love, no snap issues. Very pleased with that. Remember, that was a problem earlier in the year, and it was getting me well, upset. It was a problem for Iowa State's center, and that was a factor in the game. Yeah. They had opportunities lost because of poor snaps. Yeah, and I, I thought the communication along the offensive line, saw pointing, saw head turning, saw wow. communication, a lot okay. of talking going on. I was very I I was thrilled about that. Now for Rame, I mean that's a tough defense to play against as a center, believe me. Right? You are straining. Guy on you know that head up right? nose all day long. Right. And one thing about Rame that like he's starting to look better in pass protection. He's starting to look like he understands how to anchor, how much he needs to bend, where his hands need to go. And that is, that's good. I thought he did a nice job of anchoring in pass protection. He's still got to clean some stuff up in the run game, but all of a sudden you look up a couple solid performances in a row from yep. Andrew Rame. And I'm hoping he, he continues to build on that moving forward because they, they need him to, but if you're going to lose both tackles to the draft, you got to have that, that center has got to just be able to keep everything together. Man, so we need to continue to see him improve the way he appears to be improving. Yep, that's uh, that's good to hear. Yeah, he's um, I guess because he what was it? he didn't play a whole lot last year, right? He missed a bunch of time early. Yeah, injuries, injuries. Yeah, um, it's like sick a bunch too. Is weird. Right. Yeah, he the COVID whatever it was with that, but so he's still coming into the season of, of, of an inexperienced player. And he's yeah. He hasn't played a lot. Of, he hasn't played yeah. a lot in games. Like, and it's just different. He falls back into that, like Stutzman, Ethan Downs, like into the, that same kind of group guys that have played before, but this is the first real season to be asked to, to really shoulder the load of, uh, on their sides of the ball. And you're to the point now, what we're eight games in, and what are we probably 700, 650, 700 game snaps in for these guys? Like that's a lot of experience and you're going to start to see it show up here for the final stretch. Yeah. Okay. Last guy, Chris Murray, pretty typical game from him still gets a little peaky with his eyes every once in a while. And that gets him in trouble, but Guy plays with the attitude and the effort you want from an offensive guard, right? And I've said it so many times. He's not going to get taller. He's not going to get longer arms. So there's limitations there, but he plays the position the right way. So the only the only other thing I want to say about the offense, and I can't believe it's taken us so long to mention this, that little hockey line change thing that Levy did, that was awesome. Never seen that in my life. That was great. Yeah, and for anyone that doesn't know, it was – what it was early in the game was it early second quarter yeah early second quarter to start a drive we had nine new players out on the field all mainly young guys whole new offensive line except for rame whole new group of skill position guys except for dylan gabriel and they ran what three plays and then ran off the field and the starting offense came back out did you ever figure out what that was? Did did anyone ever talk about it? Was that something they had planned? Was that like a in response to offense, maybe not capitalizing on some opportunities? Like, I, what I, was that? I, I did not ask Lebby about it. 
I I just assume rewarding some young guys that have been practicing yeah. well. Right. And I think that's important. And this was, and once again, this is one of the fun, fun parts about being down there on the sideline. Like those young guys came off, they were all hugging and high five. Yes. They were like, that was awesome. It was, it was that's really cool. cool to see. And that's, you know, getting guys game reps. Like there's just, there's nothing that can replace that. And they did a really good job. They came out, they executed what they were supposed to do. Hockey line changed back and away the offense went. It was, I've never it's seen great. it. It was fun. Here's, here's the, here's this handful of plays you're going to get. Learn them, like rep them. This is all you focus on this. Like you got to know everything. I understand that, but here's your three plays. Picture yourself making like pancake blocks and making a guy miss or whatever it visualize. is. Visualize visualize success for these three plays. That was cool. Yeah. All right, let's get to call your shot. We asked you guys your number one takeaway from OU's win over Iowa State. This first one comes from at Sooner Wire on Twitter. They say, seeing way more energy from the coaching staff on the sideline and especially from Venables, also flawless game plan to force Iowa State's offense to beat us and not allow their defense to beat us. Remained loyal and patient with the game plan. Great job by the staff. I like that. And I will say that was that was about as fired up as I've seen Venables on the sideline all year long. Like he was, I mean, he was into it. And as the defense, and this is natural, right? He's he's a defensive guy. Like as the defense started playing better and better. Like he started getting more animated and more into it. And he was just, it was fun, man. It was fun to watch. Yep. That's good. Yeah. You know, and playing well makes, makes people excited, have more energy and, you know, the, the near past is positive with, you know, win over Kansas and now win over Iowa state, which has you more excited about the future. You know, whenever you're looking back on, like you naturally do on some things, it's not looking back on a blowout loss where you look terrible and played terrible. So you're surrounding yourself with some 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 good things right now, and I think that's carrying over to their their attitude and their energy. Everything's all good. And then I picked this last one because I wanted to get your thoughts on it. Comes from Sooner Duke on Twitter, who said defense and special teams came to play. Offense is nowhere close. It's out of sync, and play calling doesn't have any cohesiveness. Yes, too many drop passes, but there was no rhythm at all, either deep shots or line of scrimmage passes. Offense seems lost. No, I I mean, I disagree. I will say that, I don't think we have a great uh, medium, medium depth, intermediate passing game. That's not a strength of ours, like digs and stuff over the middle. And that's not, not a real strength of ours, but it's not really a, it's not something that we're, it's not really in, in the offense a whole lot with what they're doing. They, they push the ball down the field. They push it laterally. Um, I mean, I disagree. You're going against an elite defense that's been not just this year that has been elite for several years, so the numbers just aren't going to be there. I mean, I don't know. I disagree, but I I saw that take from several people yesterday, and all I can really gather from it is you have to find something to be upset about. Yeah, that's – I also disagree, and no, no offense to Sooner Duke. Uh, I'm not trying to sound condescending here, although this is – that's exactly what how this is going to sound. <laughs> if you don't think that Jeff Levy dialed up a gym in the running game yesterday, I – you just don't know football. I'm sorry. Yeah. The amount of stuff that they threw at that defense – I mean, it, I was, I was getting 
physically drained, like jotting all of the different intricacies of each concept down. I was like, oh. I mean, they threw, and I know they had two weeks to work on it. I get that. But some of the stuff that they did, like they hadn't shown, and, and the stuff that they had shown, there was different variations with motions behind it. Like, it was really good. Like, really, really good stuff. And some of the most creative concepts he had in the passing game that got dropped. Mm -hmm. So, I, and I I won't, like, Levy and I have a good relationship now. I'm going to defend him. Like, that's, but if you, if you go back and you really watch closely with the stuff that Oklahoma did in the running game, it was, I mean, it was impressive. It was impressive. And to rush for 182 yards against that defense, I, I feel like people still think Iowa State sucks. And I know their record is what it is, but, like, that defense, watch. Watch that defense the rest of the way. Watch what well, offenses don't do against that defense. People are not going to run the football against them. Yeah, And well, Oklahoma just did. The The team that just put up, what, 48 on Oklahoma State, put up a smoldering 11 against 10 or 10. It was 10 against, to nine. Yeah. Against Iowa state. Um, and that's all they do is run the football. Run they it, ran for one thirty one, and they ran it 38 times in that yeah. game. And that was with a healthy Adrian Martinez and Deuce Vaughn. Yep. Yeah. They're, it's a really good, really good defense. I don't know. Uh, I was, I was, pleased i i thought that we had opportunities offensively to break that game open but it wasn't because they were lost or meandering or not or clueless it was because a couple of big plays out there we didn't make on on plays that we should yeah i think i'm with you the intermediate passing game hasn't been great right you talk about like intermediate crossers digs you know even like the comeback stuff that has not been a huge been a huge part of this offense but if they would just connect on some of these deep balls man, like we wouldn't even be talking about this i know it i know it. it's frustrating it'll come, it'll come. yeah all right birthday shout outs happy 10th birthday to farah brisby Happy 26th birthday to Ben Jones. Farah or Farah? Did I mess that up? Farah? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I was nervous. <laughs> Happy 44th birthday to Chuko. Happy 46th birthday to Rob Jones. Happy 55th birthday to Liz Leonard. Happy 55th birthday to Susie Lebovich. I'm going Lebovich. Lebovich. Susie Lebovich. Okay. Happy 67th birthday to former suitor wide receiver Lee Hover. There we go. Let's go. All right. Let's recap some. Oh, late edition. Happy birthday. Big 10th birthday to Chariot Heaven Witna. What a name. There we go. All right. Nice one. Horse and Chariot. Yes, her name is Chariot. We got you, Noah. We got you. Happy birthday. All right, let's recap an interesting week nine of college football. But first, the only place to stop when you're road tripping is Love's Travel Stops. Love's has over 600 locations in 41 states, offering 24-hour access to clean and safe places. Whatever your road trip needs are, Love's has it. Fuel, fresh food, all the snacks and drinks, including, yes, my favorite, Java Hamari. Ooh, that, that felt like a good one. It felt good. That felt good. good. That coffee, speaking of good, that coffee is fantastic. Loves all says you've covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones. They've expanded their mobile to go zone so you can grab any of that stuff there. Make sure you download the Loves Connect app for exclusive offers from today's most popular brands. The Loves Connect app also includes a route planner and store locator. When you see that red neon heart on the highway, stop in and say hi at Love's Travel Stops. For a full list of what Love's has to offer, visit loves.com. Opolis Clothing is the exclusive home for all of our Oklahoma Breakdown merchandise. If you want to live your life in buttery soft comfort, 
go to opolisclothing.com. That's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com and use promo code TED, T-E-D, for 10% off your entire order. You still get a discount on all the OU and OKC Thunder gear as well. That's opolisclothing.com. Use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. And make sure you send your kids to Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School. Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School has a long tradition of educational excellence with a 12 to 1 student to teacher ratio. No student is overlooked. Bishop McGinnis's college prep curriculum offers 22 AP courses. There are numerous clubs and organizations for students to join. As a proud member of the OSSAA, there are 14 sports offered. If you want your child to be like Zach Schmidt, <laughs> send them to Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School. Visit bmchs.org for more information. Remember, financial aid is available. All right, National College Football Roundup, week nine of college football. Ohio State, Penn State. This was a game that was really good early, but the Buckeyes end up pulling away in just an avalanche offensively and defensively in the fourth quarter. They win 44 to 31 in Happy Valley. And Ted, I hope you love the full Sean Clifford experience we got in this game. My goodness. Yeah, well, I, he, uh, I don't know. I, I guess the only way to classify him at quarterback is volatile. It's a perfect word for him. Right? It's just, you get some gray and you get some, wait, what? Yeah. I, I mean, he, he got off to an awful start in this game, and it looked like Ohio State was going to roll, right? A couple interceptions early for Clifford, but I will. I'll give Penn State a little credit. Their defense settled in. Uh, they made some big plays in the passing game. Man, I thought hey, Parker Washington had himself a day now at wide receiver for the Nittany Lions, but there was also – Ohio State made some mistakes in the first half. Like, C.J. Stroud, you can't take that sack before the half. You can't get no points there. And somehow, some way, even though it felt like Ohio State was a way better football team, Penn State was up 14-13 at the half. The third quarter, boring, uneventful. And then the fourth quarter was insane. So Penn State scored with 926 left to go in the game. They take a 21 to 16 lead. And after it was, you know, a lucky penalty on, on a missed field goal, right? They called, you know, legal formation lined up over the center. I mean, spare me, Mr. Referee, but it was crazy. Penn state took all the momentum at that point and it was all Ohio state after it. It made no sense, but yeah. I, I think it tells you a lot about Ohio state. Like it, you remember, you remember the Golden State Warriors? Yeah. Like when it felt like that avalanche was coming? Yes. That is they how hit, this felt. It's like they hit two back-to-back -back threes, and it's like, oh, no. Here it, <laughs> comes. it just, it just <laughs> all happens at once. And, uh, I mean, it was unreal. Touchdown. 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 Pick six. I mean, it was, it was such a massive momentum swing. On the road for Ohio State, it was – it was impressive, but the man of the day, right? Player of the game, JT Tuimo Loao. You talk about a statistical day. My goodness. Just an insane, insane day stats-wise for the DN. He's incredible. Um, That's a big athletic dude now. Whoa. He, he, I know. he. The way he moves, he looks way smaller than what he is, and I mean that as uh, a compliment. That dude is is a beast, and how they keep finding those those edge guys there is just incredible. The Bosa's, um, why am I drawing a blank? Washington Redskins, um, Chase Young, Chase Young, like they've been putting out some unbelievable guys from those spots, and it looks like he's the next uh, in line for that dude. Is a beast. Yeah, he had a sack strip bump. So first. He had a batted ball that ended up in an interception. He had two sacks, including one that was a sack strip fumble that he recovered. We call that the golden sombrero. He had another fumble recovery. 
and then had a pick six. I mean, his impact on the game was insane. I mean, it, it was insane. And CJ Stroud, he had some he had some really nice throws in that second half. Marvin Harrison Jr. had himself a day. And luckily the Nittany Lions scored late and covered the spread. <laughs> <laughs> Because I, I picked him to cover on my betting show uh, for the bet online stuff. But it was, I, I think the big takeaway is that fourth quarter where you see just how, when it all comes together for Ohio State, man, watch out. Yeah, against against a, a solid football team. Penn State still struggling to win the big ones, man. Um, it's tough. Like, like they, they've got a tough slate to get through, right? You know, you can't just be... You can't be an okay football team and make it through that division right now, which, you know, sucks for them, but that's just the nature of the beast and uh, probably will be uh, as we continue to move forward. But just how it is right now, Ohio State, really, really good. I I know you're a huge James Franklin fan, which is <laughs> why I tracked down this little nugget for you. It comes from our buddy, Brett McMurphy. James Franklin is now two and 15 straight up versus top 10 teams with 11 consecutive losses. First top 10 First top 10 straight up. Yeah. So not against the spread, just straight up. He is now two and 15 and he has lost 11 straight of those games. I'll say the same thing to the Penn state faithful close one more raise. One more raise and extension for Franklin and you'll be there. It'll all, <laughs> all come together. It's that's the key here. He's just not quite making enough money. I I don't even really know what to say about this next game. Oklahoma State went to Manhattan and 48 to nothing. I mean 48 to nothing. And th- listen, I know OU fans and OSU fans are going at it on Twitter. What was worth? Oh, you lost to Texas. Oklahoma State's lost to Kansas State. They're both awful, but I I did not see this coming at all. Now I I thought K State could win the game, but my goodness, Ted, like what? No one saw this coming. What the hell? No, 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 no. It's Gundy's it's worst good. loss ever. Gundy's worst loss. Yeah, I I can imagine. Like, yes, that is. I feel like. I feel like this is. Not to make this about me, but I feel like this is whoever is in charge of running the simulation that we're currently in. Saw or heard my. laughter at will howard and how he's looked as a backup quarterback and has decided to say oh really you think it's funny that will howard's never lost a game and it looks atrocious every time he goes and plays for kansas state watch this little move that we can uh put in the simulation to make everything turn on its head the guy looks unbelievable like are we sure that Colin Klein hasn't just switched places and started like, are we positive that that's actually Will Howard? Has someone verified that? They kept showing Colin Klein in the booth and our, ba- our okay. man, Brian LePac was sitting right next to him. I feel like this is like a little league situation where someone needs to go check a birth certificate. I. Okay. And I will be the first to admit as, as recently as last week, I have talked about Will Howard needing to switch to tight end if he wants to play in the National Football League on my right. radio show on Sirius. Uh, I, I said that last week. And 296 yards, four touchdowns later, and a 48 to nothing win over Oklahoma State. Is it time that we start crafting our official apology to Will Howard? Do we get to hold on to it for one more week? They got Texas. Do we get to hold on to our beliefs about Will Howard. And is this a mirage? Are we being duped? Because he's looked great two weeks in a row against two really good football teams. I know what happened to Oklahoma state. They didn't look good. That's a good team. 
TCU's a good team. Yeah. And he's looked awesome at quarterback, not tight end <laughs> at quarterback. Right. Um, I, I'm ready to craft the apology now. Okay. I, t- I'm sorry. And maybe, maybe the, the, um, whoever's running the, the, the matrix, the matrix, whatever is going to laugh at me whenever I switch my opinion to be like, Hey, my fault. The dude's unbelievable. Let Texas go up there and get the win. And he throws four interceptions, but I'm sorry. From what I've seen from him the last couple of weeks and what I know about Kansas State as a football team, there ain't no way Texas is going to win that football game. I th- this is this is something we need to talk about. What does Chris Kleiman do moving forward? Because to me, I, you can't go back to Adrian Martinez with the way that Will Howard's looked the last two weeks. And I know Adrian Martinez, uh, he's got all the respect in the world from the guys in that locker room. But that offense has opened up. Yeah. I mean, the passing game, it it's like Will Howard is pushing it down the field. And looks good doing it. Like, all of a sudden, Kurt Warner's kid is just a baller. Malik Knowles looks like the guy that you and I thought he always was going to be. Yep. All kinds of explosive plays. That's opening stuff up for Deuce Vaughn. I mean, they had touchdown plays of 38, 62, 31, and 41. Kansas State, I mean, they gashed Oklahoma State's defense. I mean, Deuce Vaughn, and it's all tied together offensively, right? You're throwing it down the field well. Okay. Hey, maybe we got to loosen up some coverage. Okay. We'll run it. You want to play two deep safeties? We're going to run it. Deuce Vaughn had several runs. He's untouched onto Oklahoma State safeties, like 12 yards down the field, full yep. speed, running right out of I was just like, oh, my. It was crazy to watch. Yeah. Well, we were all on the plane watching it going, what the hell is going on here? I know. It, well, it, when it first started, we are doing the post-game show, and, 7-0 Kansas State. Oh, dang. And then Deuce Vaughn rips off a long run. 14-0 Kansas State. Oh, wow. It's going to be hard for Oklahoma State to get back in that. 21-0 Kansas State. 28-0 Kansas State. 35-0. It's like, whoa, what is happening? That's crazy. Once that thing starts rolling like that and that crowd, I guarantee you that place was insane. Uh, as loud as 55,000 people can get, it happens whenever they have put games together like that in Manhattan. So, yeah, I, I you got to go with Will Howard right now till you have the op- – like, you can't put Adrian Martinez in there until there's a reason to put him in there. You it's, just can't. I, I think it's very similar to the Max Duggan and yeah, Chandler Moore exactly. situation. Exactly, yep. It, I mean, Will Howard has gone in because of Adrian Martinez's injury, and the man has balled out. Now, he hadn't been perfect, but he's played really, really well. A couple more thoughts on this game. Spencer Sanders taking a lot of heat for this one. I I don't know what the guy's supposed to do when your offensive line can't block. And it wasn't like the run game, non-existent. Spencer Sanders was getting just absolutely hammered back there. Running for his life. Like, I mean, just... If your offensive line does not play good football, then you're in trouble. And Kansas State's defensive front whooped their ass. Yep. And now Sanders ends up falling on that shoulder again and goes out and poor Gunner Gundy. <laughs> the hands were shaking. The the flip, the flip interception was bad. Like I I felt bad for I felt for that young man, but that was that would the way that that game unfolded, man. That was shocking. Yeah, like I thought, Oklahoma State loses game. They when's the last time they just got thoroughly beat down like that? I mean, I don't remember it. No, not. I mean, I I remember times when they've been down where they're not a great football team and they've had it handed to them. But of a score like that, I can't remember, and definitely not whenever they're. A, 
top 10 football team. Yeah. You know, that was, that was wild. Did not see that coming. Yeah. The shaking thing. Like he just took off on a run, a scramble. Like, yeah, give the guy a break. He's got. I know people think it's funny, but it's just like, hey, give the guy a break. When you've got that much adrenaline like coursing through your body, it's and you take a shot, like it's not not that big big of a deal. But here's the thing, man. That's why quarterback is so hard to play. Is you've got to find a way to settle that, calm down. And not, not approach the next play like there's one second left in the game, and the whole, the whole season depends on the making this something happen here. And you go, you know, crazy into a flip where just no reason to do it. Quarterback is is not nearly as easy as it looks from you know the uh, the house or the stands. It's tough. Yeah. All right. Last game. We don't really need to spend much time on this one, I don't think. Kentucky went to Tennessee and got smacked. 44-6, to six, an absolute beatdown uh, from the Volunteers and sets the stage for – and I know the college football playoff rankings come out on Tuesday. Could be number one versus number two, Tennessee, Georgia. But I – I'd be surprised. Yeah, maybe Ohio State, but I, I think Tennessee's going to be number one when you look at the resume. The I, Georgia should be, but I think the the college football playoff, I guarantee you Heifel doesn't want them to be number right. one. Well, you might as well make it one versus two right. just to draw more interest because it doesn't matter who wins the game will be number one and who loses the game will be you know, go back to number four or something like that. Yeah. So there's not going to be a whole lot of movement. You might as well have one versus two, baby. Here we go. But I'll tell you right now, uh, I picked Kentucky. I, I picked Kentucky to make it close. What was it like a 13 and a half point spread? Something like yeah, that. Yeah, 12 and a half, something 12 like and that. 12 and a half. Uh, I, was I like, picked Kentucky, Kentucky to get their ass kicked. Well, and. <laughs> I picked him to cover thinking that, okay, this is with all the hype that's gone on with the Georgia game looming. Like this is just this as good as Kentucky's been defensively. This is just going to be an ugly game that Tennessee finds a way to win. It took all of about three seconds into Tennessee's entrance before I was like, Kentucky's about to get their ass kicked. <laughs> you, that was unbelievable. You- this the entrance which has to be up there in the best in college football we were watching this on the team flight home you turned around to me and you go do you see tennessee's entrance i go yeah they're gonna roll them <laughs> like it was incredible fireworks they lit up the tea i mean that thing now hey that early in that game kentucky was running the ball well with chris rodriguez scored but that was it for the kentucky offense I mean, Tennessee's defense pitched a shutout the rest of the way on Will Levis, who did not look great. Uh, Dude was getting hit, throwing picks. Uh, Did not look like Levis was having very much fun. But I don't know. It's like Jalen Hyatt puts a spell on safeties. Like the guy just runs wide open (laughs) down the field and catches touchdowns. Like that's – they throw quicks. They spread you out and run it, and they just throw it deep to Jalen Hyatt, who is uncovered somehow. It's it's. I would like to say he's an amazing receiver, but I've yet to see him do anything that's truly amazing. It's just catch a catch an in stride deep ball with no one within ten yards from you. But no, nah, he is he is incredible. But what's happening at Tennessee right now with the momentum and the excitement of a fan base that's been down for so long? This is what makes college football unlike anything else, right? Just, and you can see it in that stadium. And it's hard. It's like when you're at home and you've got that many people behind you, it's almost impossible to lose, no matter yeah. what happens. Now, yeah. on the road, and, separate issue. Yeah. I, I don't think Kentucky's guys had very much fun. No. No. The, the black jerseys, I think I like them. I still, I'm still trying to decide. 
Because I really like Tennessee. Like on the spectrum of orange, like Tennessee's orange is, you know, causes the least negative reaction for me. So the but the black and orange, I'm just I'm trained to, ugh, you know. Yeah. So the I struggled with ma- them. The black makes the orange sharper. You know, it's typically it lands a little softer on the retina. Yes, it doesn't give you the traffic cone feel. It, like it makes me. It's like do. oh, sherbet, delicious, yeah. kind of welcoming. But yeah. when you when you put black around it, it goes back to being that sharp, contrasting orange. But I didn't mind it for them. Like I didn't care after that entrance. It didn't really matter to me with the lit up <laughs> tea. I was like, that was that was awesome. That was really cool. All right, let's finish with our winners and losers of the weekend. But first... It's football time in Oklahoma, people, and there's nothing better to drink at the tailgate than Clubby Seltzers. Clubby Seltzers is an Oklahoma company that is already winning national awards because their product is delicious. It tastes exactly like a club special, but it's a seltzer. And they're not just for tailgating either. They're perfect to drink on the golf course, by the pool, after mowing the lawn, whatever. If you haven't tried Clubby Seltzers yet, go grab some. You won't regret it. Clubby's variety pack is out. They've got some new flavors out. They've got a new can. To find a place near you that has Clubby's, visit clubbyseltzers.com. And attention, business owners. You need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective, comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. Insurica's clients become best-in-class businesses by working with Insurica's team of advisors to manage risk. Purchasing insurance is only one way to protect your business. Best-in-class businesses win by avoiding a loss in the first place. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. I'm an Insurica client, and you should be too. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A dot com. As always, Ted, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the weekend? I got to go with the Big 12. Oh, big money, Big 12. Let's go. According to Pete Thamel, the Big 12 is on the cusp of extending its current television contract with ESPN and Fox to the tune of a six-year, $2.28 billion contract extension that includes a huge step up in pay. Going to be around the $50 million per school mark. Game-changing money um, for the schools that are staying. This is an absolute home run. If you're Houston, UCF, BYU, and Cincinnati, you just hit the damn lottery, right? Off of coming off of conferences that make like what ten million a year, so you just hit the lottery on this deal. Um, it, it's awesome, and they're giving a lot of credit to your mark and how he approached this deal. Did not go to the open market. Started negotiating early with the current partners with Fox and ESPN. Set everything in motion. Um, this is big. This is big for the Big 12. You and I both agree that this is going to be an excellent conference, even without Oklahoma and Texas moving forward. In- incredibly uh, competitive across all sports um, with some really good schools, really competitive schools in there think this is a uh this is an awesome win for the big 12 and comes you know right on the hills of your mark saying what last week he's uh he's letting it be known he's not hiding we're going national we want to take this conference national so um really good stuff yeah yeah i i thought it was a it was a big big win uh for the future of the big 12 and a huge win for brett your mark this is this is why he got the job. This is what he said he was going to do. And he got it done and he got it done quickly. And he got it done before the PAC 12 got it done. So I, I am interested to see if he's able to use this. I I'm interested to see if there's anything built into the agreement where it says they make 
X amount more if they add more teams. Yeah. Right. And if that allows him to go to some of these teams in the Pac-12 saying, hey, we've got this number. And if you come, it's this number. That's right. And that and puts can, yeah, go ahead. Klyavkov in a very tricky spot. Remember that he was preaching, hey, we're all together, patience, all this stuff. These universities start seeing these dollar figures and they start getting scared that they may not get it. I I know you preach patience, like, hey, when we go to the open market, we're gonna get more. There's Amazon, there's app, there's all that. Now that the Big 12's got it done before him, there's there'll be some nervous administrators, Ted. Yep. No, I, I totally agree. Um I I think there 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 is definitely going to come a time where people consume live sports the same way they do television through streaming services. I think that just seems like the natural way things are going to go. But ain't yet. That ain't happening yet. People still prefer to watch live sports on their television the traditional way, and ESPN and Fox uh, is the way to go right now for the Big 12. And I I don't even know the fact that they got this done before the – like the Pac-12 really – they don't have a whole heck of a lot to stand on. And you're right. Like if this, if there's, if there's like the, that, that extra little segment of the contract for adding teams by 2025 or whenever that, whenever it's supposed to go into uh, effect, which I believe was 2025 is what it said. Um, $50 million with the current market for the PAC 12 buddy, Utah, Colorado, and the Arizona schools, are probably having a meeting right now saying, let's go, let's go. So I, I thought it was a huge win for the Big 12. I'm with you. And j- just one last thing, I'm happy. I mean, we're Big 12 guys. We'll always be Big 12 guys. I know, and a lot of people saw this, and like, yes, it's not it's not close with the Pac-12 or what the, uh, the Big 10 and the SEC are going to bring in, right? We all know that. But – it feels feels really good for the for the Big Ten. Why can't I say conferences right now? What is happening to me? Well, it's good for the Big Twelve. None of it makes any sense. There's <laughs> the, the teams I, don't like. It's not like I, I will say with ESPN not being involved in the Big Ten's new deal, right? And they're probably going to prop up the Big Twelve a little more. I mean, I think that's natural to assume like the big 12 is going to get some, some better slots. You know, the SEC will get the best ones, right? That's just how it's going to work. But the big 12, the new big 12, whatever you want to call it, they may get, they may get some more love with ESPN, you know, now that they're not worried about the big 10. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, Fascinated to see what this means for really the rest of the conferences. Yeah. What's it mean for the Big Ten adding? What's it mean for the Big 12 adding? What's it mean for OU and Texas as far as dates are concerned moving to the SEC? You know, I, I know that everything still says that that 2025 starting date, which, you know, I, I've got no problem if we wait until then, right, to get to get ourselves in order. But, you know, I feel like – this contract getting done is very meaningful for the time frame moving forward for Oklahoma. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. All right. Who do you have as your loser of the weekend? The Carolina Panthers. Ooh. It, what has to be one of the craziest exchanges I've seen in case everyone didn't witness this. The Panthers are down six. They're playing Atlanta somehow for first place in the NFC South, okay? They're down six. There's 30 seconds to go. They're on their own 38-yard line. P.J. Walker, who they acquired off the street, essentially was playing in in the XFL a couple of years ago for Houston. First and 10. Rolls to his left. Throws a bomb all the way down the field. Touchdown to DJ Moore. 
All they have to do is kick the extra point. Game over. 15 seconds left. Uh, DJ Moore gets a penalty. 15-yarder, taking his hat off or helmet off. Excessive celebration. Backs the extra point up. Miss the extra point. We're going to overtime. In overtime is, uh, you know, the football gods would have it. You missed the field goal on the uh, on the opening possession, and Atlanta, easy as can be, right down the field, kicks the field goal to win it. Carolina loses. Brutal. Absolutely brutal. I personally, and I know it's a penalty. I think you hold that flag if you're that official. I just, it, it, it was a massive play. It was just super emotional. Rips the helmet off. He's like screaming. I was not a big fan of the call. Like, I mean, he wasn't like screaming in a Falcons player's face really or anything like that. I don't know, man. It, that's I, ag- a, I agree with you. I, that's a I tough don't... way to lose a game. I don't care about, uh, I think a celebration penalty is dumb. If anything, like after a moment like that, on that type of play, that type of bomb, it's a delay of game, right? You got to get off the field. We got to continue the game, delay of game. I don't care that he took his helmet off. I, I think it's, I think it's dumb. But here's the thing. It's a rule, man. It's a yeah. rule. And that's that's part of it is keeping your emotions in check. Brutal. I think that I was. saw only, only two times in like the last, I don't know what the number was, years that a kicker has missed a, an extra point to win it and a field goal to win it in the same game. And it's... I, I think maybe the last 20 years, something like that. Tough. That's Eddie that's Pinheiro tough. with the, with a couple of misses. You think he's mad at DJ Moore? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> oh. All right. Let's get to my winner and loser. But first. First Fidelity Bank is a full service financial institution based in Oklahoma with tailored solutions for all your personal and business needs, checking accounts, saving accounts, home loans, and much more. They do it all, whether it's online banking from your computer or mobile banking from your phone. Everything is stress-free with FFB. Making mobile deposits, paying bills online, and moving money to different accounts could not be easier. First Fidelity Bank provides free ATMs worldwide, making banking convenient wherever you are. They also give back to the community. FFB donates a total of more than $500,000 to local charities and educational foundations. Make your life easier and go bank with First Fidelity Bank. Visit ffb.com for more information. And if you're a whiskey or bourbon drinker, stop what you are doing. Head to your favorite liquor store and buy some Balcones products. you got to grab some of Balcones Lineage Single Malt Whiskey. It was voted one of the top 20 whiskeys in the world by Whiskey Advocate, and you'll be shocked by how affordable it is. Also, you got to snag some of Balcones Baby Blue Corn Whiskey. It's made from blue corn. That's the fancy corn. And that is why it has won more than 25 awards. Last but certainly not least, you got to buy some of Balcones Pot Still Bourbon. It's big flavors make it the perfect bourbon to drink year-round. Remember in 2012, Balcones Single Malt won the best-in-glass competition, beating brands like Johnny Walker and McAllen. This stuff is the real deal, people. If you love great whiskey and bourbon at a great price, then Balcones products are the only way to go. The whiskey may be made in Texas, but the owners are from Oklahoma. To find a liquor store that has it, visit BalconesDistilling.com. All right, for my winner of the weekend. Ted, do you know who Isaiah Joe is? No. Name doesn't ring a bell at all, I'm assuming. And I, I guarantee you, you're not alone. But Isaiah Joe had himself a weekend because... That man buried a three for the Oklahoma City Thunder. I was up late Saturday night watching me some NBA basketball, baby. And he buried a three. 
to tie things up at 99, eventually sent the Thunder Mavs game into overtime, where then he proceeded to drop another eight points in overtime to cap off an awesome comeback win for the Oklahoma City Thunder. It was great. It was one of those, like, they just signed him. He's barely been there. Like, no, no, he's just a nobody in the NBA and absolutely stepped up in huge moments. Now, that's awesome. Shea Gilgis Alexander was also that dude. Uh, dropped, dropped a 38 piece. He was fantastic as well. But Isaiah Joe, Ted, I love stuff like this. No, I do too. Anytime you've got a guy just showing up, trying to do anything to earn the stripes, stay on a team trying to get a little bit of tenure in the league and you do something like that, that gains you a little bit of confidence and rest easy maybe for a couple of nights. Yeah. And one thing Lou Dort was kind of back to being himself. He was a pest for Luka Doncic. Such a pest. In fact, that Luka Doncic after the game said, he's one of the top three defenders in the NBA. Really? Okay. That's got to make our man Dort feel good. That was, I know it made me feel good. Well, it makes you get back to what got you where you are, right? Ah, okay. I'm getting I'm getting credit for being great at defense. Let's continue to put our focus there. Yeah, but my winner of the weekend, Lane Kiffin. I mean, <laughs> it was so Ole Miss goes to College Station, hands Texas A&M another L. By the way, the Aggies are now three and five on the season. I I will say this about A&M. I can understand why some Aggie fans have a little hope. Connor Wegman could rip it, man. Yeah. He he looked, you know, he made some mistakes, but he looked really good. I mean, it, as a true freshman, like, you can see it. That guy, that guy should be a dude for them if they don't mess him up somehow. But I, I don't know why he wasn't playing already, but he... he looked- he looked miserable out there from when I switched it over and started watching that game. Dude, he, that's he and, took and a Jimbo big Fisher's shot. gonna get some questions. He took that big shot to the head. And I, I don't know if who he was talking to was a trainer or what, but when Jimbo kind of ripped him away from it and he went back out there and he was all wide eyed and then came back to the bit, that was that was not a good look for Jimbo Fisher. Well, he kept asking him, Are you okay? And you know, well, what's he going to say? No, right. coach. That's it. Exactly. I'm concussed. Like, he's not going to say that. Yeah, he uh, he he looked like a UFC fighter between rounds is yes. how, how bad he looked from that point on. <laughs> that is that's a great way of putting it. But Lane Kiffin's the winner of the weekend because now his team, you know, it was a good game and they they finished the job. Right. I thought Jackson Dart. Did some really good things. Throwing the ball. Continues to use his legs as a weapon. Uh, Quinshaw Judkins. Happy birthday to that young man. 205 rushing yards on that A&M defense. But Lane Kiffin's post-game interview was priceless. I mean, I was cracking up. What did he do? One of the first things he was like, oh, 390 yards rushing against a bunch of five stars is pretty good. I mean, he was just taking shot after shot. Our buddy Cole Kublik asked him what he was going to be for Halloween. He said, maybe Jimbo has a Joker outfit for me. It was, I mean, it was hilarious. I think he was a little uh, perturbed at all of the fake injuries. I I mean, A&M did the thing and they, they did it so often. It was insane. Like just laying down, trying to slow Ole Miss down. And I think that was, I think that was what, had Kiffin in that mood after the game, but it was wildly entertaining. No, it was it was crazy. Now, A and M made it a game late, and then did you see the end of that game? There's like a, a minute and thirty five, a minute. They 40 had the ball left. to go win it. Basically, I mean, because the onside kick got uh, didn't get it, but then got the stop. They didn't, they kicked it deep. The kicker, like, so they line up to kick off and Ole Miss has their hands team and they don't have anyone deep. So all you do is just chip it over the the front line 
and okay, they run back there and they dive on it. That's fine. Like you don't have to do like a, an onside kick right there, but the kicker kicked it through the end zone and Jim Fisher and the special teams coach went insane on that kicker. Like you Jim was like, what the fuck is he doing? <laughs> I, I guess I that. didn't I was... see that there was nobody back deep or something. I don't know what happened, but boy, I was watching. I was like, what are they doing? Why just chip it over the top out of the end zone? Amazing. Oh, that's brutal. Well, that makes it even better. <laughs> <laughs> All right. For my loser of the weekend, uh, thought about going with that situation after the Michigan Michigan state game. Whoa. Yeah, that was I mean, wild. That that was ugly. I've got a lot of questions for a lot of people. And I understand it's one tunnel, but it's been that way for forever. How did the Michigan guys end up on their own? You know what's interesting is... How are they alone? This, this got brought up last week by Franklin, remember? Yeah. He was talking about the tunnel and something's got to be done and it's not safe. And Jim Harbaugh's like, yeah, well that was the Penn state guys, you know? So if anything needs to happen, it needs to happen on their end. And here it is. It's almost like to prove the point that the single tunnel is not a good idea that I, I don't know. That was, that was wild. Yeah. I'm not trying to excuse what the Michigan state players right. did right there. There's, I mean, there's just no room for that either, but it's just a real, it's a terrible idea to be in that situation alone, man. Yep. I so, you know, strength in numbers. I don't know how those guys ended up there. You know, you know, movies or like TV shows where it like cuts to the narrator and they're like, You may be wondering how I ended up here. <laughs> right. That's yeah. what was going through my head. It's like, how did those guys end up alone? That's wild. Yeah, I, I don't know. But Big Ten cops investigating that whole thing. Ugh. That's so assault, brother. That's assault, brother. But that was a that was a bad situation. But my loser of the weekend, the fan base was so fired up, Ted. The New York Jets. Mm. So much excitement around the team. MetLife was breathing fire early. They wore the sweet black helmets and everything. And Bill and Belichick and your New England Patriots. They own the Jets, man. I mean, Bill Belichick owns the Jets. Patriots have now beat them 13 times in a row, which is insane in the National Football League. That's an insane streak. And Zach Wilson, he had some he had some rough throws, don't get me wrong. But the game started well for him. Looked like they were getting things rolling. Now the, the pick six that got called back, that was... That was a huge play, but right. Mac Jones did some good things. Solid day for Ramondre Stevenson. And I know not eye popping stats, but thought he played well. And now Bill Belichick is second all time in coaching wins. Solo second in NFL history. Poor jets. They thought they, they were so fired up and the Patriots came and just, Pushed them around like they have been for years. Well, in order to uh, to get the guys amped up for the game and to um, and to watch some good solid football, the Patriots flew into Iowa to watch the uh, the Sooners pound Iowa State before uh, before heading back and beating the Jets. Do no one but the people that were on the plane home get your joke? <laughs> what was that plane doing I, there? The Patriots I, plane was on the tarmac in Des Moines, Iowa. Yes, the Patriots, and it said six times Super Bowl. It was the team plane for sure. Yes, I'm guessing they've got a new one now, and they sold that to someone in a big, a big some company Patriots who charges fan? it out. <laughs> Let me paint the pic. Like we're getting on the Delta charter flight to come back. You go to Des Moines, right? You go to the Des Moines airport to fly back from the Iowa state game. And the Patriots team plane is sitting right next to the Delta plane. 
And we're all like, what the hell is happening? Like, and we're checking the schedule. We're like, well, there's not an NFL team. And I, we were so confused. And then one guy was like, oh, they sold the plane to this company. And now they just charter it out. I was, but we all were trying to figure out what the hell was going on. Yep. That was pretty cool though. Pretty cool. Yeah. Sorry, Jets. Yeah. Right. When you've, you've got them right where you want them. They're not playing good. Patriots are down. Like what's happening. QB controversy. QB controversy. No big deal. Jets is our get right game. <laughs> I, the Jets miss Brees Hall. That yeah. run game just, it, it's not the same without him. So do the Iowa State Cyclones. Correct. And on that note, episode 262 in the books. We'll have a new podcast that'll drop Wednesday. Just a reminder, you can hear Teddy from 3 to 6 on 94.7 The Ref. You can hear me from 2 to 5. On Sirius Sex and Big 12 Radio, Channel 375. Hope you all have a great week. Have a safe and happy Halloween. Be careful. Watch out for those cars. Try Your kids are trick-or-treated. Be careful. Keep your head on a swivel, parents. Until next time, we appreciate you all for listening. Do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.